These are your visual notes for chapter 8, Cellular Respiration, part 2. Uh, we just had the introduction, and you, we learned the basic concepts, and now we are ready to work with the big, sheet, the big picture here. So let me show you around, so you can become familiar with, this is like the playing the game board, how we are going to play. So first right there we have a blood vessel with a red blood cell that carries oxygen and dissolved in the blood actually in the plasma in the liquidy part of the blood. We have glucose, we have some CO2 and a bunch of other molecules. Right now the only ones that we care about is that glucose is there and that the red blood cells have oxygen. Then you will see here is a humongous cell all over and if you want to color the cell membrane that would be awesome that way you get the color coded so the most outdoor outside that's the cell membrane of course so this is a ginormous cell with a gigantic mitochondria so here is the outer membrane of the mitochondria as you can see the outer membrane and the inner membrane of the mitochondria that is highly folded. So, cell membrane, outer membrane of the mitochondria, inner membrane of the mitochondria. This is going to be important that you become good at naming all these membranes. And the names, of, of course, are written all over the place. Now, inside the mitochondria, so you have outer membrane, inner membrane this space that is between those two membranes is called the intermembrane space a good name for that now in the inner membrane all over the inner membrane the inner membrane is packed with proteins that are located in the membrane and i want you to know three of them four of them and notice that I have put them all over the place in one, two, three, one, two, three. They're all in threes all over the place. Protein number one is called NADH dehydrogenase. You have it right there. NADH dehydrogenase. And you need to start listening to the names because the names are telling you things. And by that you already can figure out something. The second protein is called cytochrome BC complex and cytochromes you're gonna be hearing about them all the way till the end of the year from now on and the third protein is called cytochrome C so all those one two three are all the same in your textbook you're gonna see that in between there are some other small molecules we don't need to know those names so don't worry about them but if you want to notice in your, they have a couple of little ones circular in between that they are in the drawings in your textbook. We don't need to know. Now, these three proteins that are located there is what we call the electron transport chain. Electron transport chain made out of those three proteins. In reality, I want you to add this right now, in reality, what these three proteins are, these are electron pumps. Electron pumps. And we already talked about electron pumps when we looked at all the proteins in the cell membrane. So this is the electron transport chain, but deep inside you're going to realize what these proteins do. They are really electron pumps. They're pumping. Sorry, not electron pumps. What am I saying? I apologize. Hydrogen pumps. Sorry. Redo that. <laughs> Hydrogen pumps. Proton pumps, to be more exact. Proton pumps. I apologize for that slip there. Proton pumps. All right? So we have those three proteins. Now there is another protein that is all over the place in this inner membrane of the mitochondria. And it's this one that has a, the shape of a little bottle. And you already were exposed to those. And that is called ATP synthase. 
ATP synthase. We looked at those when very quickly when you did your enzymes. So ATP synthase. Right? So that's all you have. The whole membrane is packed with those things. And then the inside here of the mitochondria, this is called the matrix. And a lot of um, compounds are found here. A lot of molecules are found here. And one set of molecules that is found here are the molecules that are part of what we call the Krebs cycle. So what is this Krebs cycle thing? The Krebs cycle is a series of molecules. The names are in your textbook. We don't need to know them. But what is important is the number of carbons that are labeled here. And these molecules are in the matrix and they react in a particular sequence, as we will see. So I think we have a nice tool. We have everything that we need in place so we can start our journey here. So since we are going to do cellular respiration, of course we are going to need this is happening in all your cells and everything is going to start with your glucose diffusing from the blood into the cell through one of those famous GLAD proteins after, of course, insulin has made contact with the receptor. Remember that? So those, all those GLAD proteins are going to be inserted in the membrane and glucose is going to be able to diffuse into the cell. So we have glucose coming into the cytoplasm. All right, we have the cytoplasm of the cell right there. The first step that we're going to study is what we call glycolysis. And I'm going to pretty much give you just a little bit of the summary of glycolysis. But I recommend, highly recommend, that for once, just once, just once for the whole year, you spend some quality time with figure 9.9 .9, glycolysis step by step in page 169. It looks very scary. Just read every word, put your fingers, look at the molecules, and you're gonna see that all that I'm saying now that is a summary, you can see it happening step by step in your textbook. So we're gonna start with a molecule of glucose and your molecule of glucose, of course, has six carbons right here. All right, I'm going to do this in, a, in my model first. So you have your molecule of glucose that has the six carbons. Of course, the, you have the hydrogens and hydroxyls attached. For now, only carbons is what we are going to track in this process. The first step that is going to happen to this glucose, we are going to need two molecules of ATP. We're going to need two molecules of ATP. Here comes one molecule of ATP. And this molecule is going to, with the help of a kinase, is going to phosphorylate this. Basically, this phosphate is going to attach to my glucose there. So now I just have a DP. So that was one ATP that we use. Now is coming another ATP. And again, with the help of a kinase, it's going to phosphorylate. This phosphate is going to attach there. And there you have, and of course I have another ADP here. And right now you have a molecule of glucose with a phosphate attached at each end. Remember that these are PO4s, phosphate groups with a negative charge. And basically, those extra electrons are destabilizing the molecule and the molecule is just shaking and moving all over the place because too many negative charges. And what's going to happen here? The molecule of glucose is going to split into two. Three carbons with one phosphate, three carbons with one phosphate just because of the extra tension that was caused by the extra, extra electron in that phosphate group. So what happened here? We are in our glucose here 
and I'm gonna draw the two, three, four, five, six carbons and I encourage you to draw your carbons too because that's gonna make this process better. And the first thing that we are gonna need is we are gonna need two ATPs that are gonna come in as I show you and they are gonna phosphorylate so they are gonna drop the phosphate and when they drop their phosphate what you have left is just ADP so I'm gonna have two ADPs leaving so funny we are trying to make ATP but first we need to use some ATP because this is like business this is what we call the investment phase we are investing two ATPs in order to make ATPs. You have to invest money to make money. All right. So we have that. And the result is that our glucose is going to break into these three molecules. And of course, you are going to have that phosphate group attached. And this new molecule with three carbons, the short version is just G3P, G3P, which in reality is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate that you have at the top of your big sheet there. And this is an important intermediary molecule that you are going to see again later when we do photosynthesis. So G3P, three carbons. And now we have two of these G3Ps, all right? We have two of these G3Ps. What's going to happen next? Now is where it gets tricky and there is a lot of shuffling of electrons and moving of hydrogens around and oxygens and inorganic phosphates, just a simple phosphate that is not a PO4 minus with energy, just a simple phosphate is gonna be added. A lot of things, that's why I want you to look in detail, if you want, just once, there. If not, just take my summary. What's gonna happen now? What's gonna happen now is that because of the rearranging of the atoms, this these two molecules, what they are going to do, there's going to be a poor, let me move the camera, there's going to be a poor ADP someplace, and this is going to have so much energy because of some other things that are going on around there, that this molecule is going to have so much energy here that it's going to be able to grab this phosphate and stick it there. Stick it there. So we are going to be able to make ATP by the direct transfer of a phosphate from here to here. And this method of making ATP is called substrate level phosphorylation. And you are going to just copy that and you are going to be very good at this by the end of today. Substrate level phosphorylation. In the back of your big sheet, you have substrate level phosphorylation there. And this is ATP made by the direct transfer of a phosphate from an organic substrate to ADP. With the help with that enzyme, of course. So here is the result. We had we have this molecule. Remember we have two of these. One going this way and going another one going this way. And as I explained to you what's going to happen because of some rearranging of the atoms, you this phosphate is going to be transferred directly with the help of an enzyme from here to here to make ATP 
and that is called substrate, substrate level phosphorylation. Now, in that process, of course, these are going to get rid of those phosphates and they are going to become much more stable. So, let's summarize that in one little step here. So, here comes one, let me do it in red, here comes one ADP, here comes ADP. What's going to happen, and you're going to have to take my word for this, there are two coming and two coming, two of these. These are going to come, they are going to pick up those phosphates, and we are going to have two ATPs out of this one, and this one is going to come, pick up the phosphates, and we are going to get two ATPs out of that one. You wonder why if we only had two, now we had four? It's because at some point we picked up this inorganic phosphate, inorganic phosphorus that are going to get energized. So don't worry about that. So we are producing two ATPs here two ATPs here, all because the molecule, molecule of glucose broke into half. Now, there is one more thing that is happening here that is extremely important. When you break the molecule, of course, and when you rearrange things and phosphates come and go, of course, electrons are released. And so here comes our good friend NADH. And we have one NADH coming here, NAD plus coming. NAD plus is going to come, pick up that electron that was released from this one, and it's going to become NADH. And the same thing is going to happen on the other one, because this also suffers rearranging. So here comes one NAD plus, picks up the electron and when it leaves is NADH. All right. So each one of these G3Ps, this one produces two ATPs and one NADH. Remember this is our electron carrier. And this one produces two ATPs also and of course 1NADH. By the time this three carbon molecule that started with that that started with that phosphate group and that were so unstable and release that phosphate and all those electrons and the molecule rearranges to some of the hydrogens. By the time all the process is done, what you have left is a molecule called pyruvate. This one becomes one pyruvate, this one becomes one pyruvate, so you are going to have a total of two pyruvates. Two pyruvates. One pyruvate, another pyruvate, and pyruvate is a three carbon molecule you are going to end up with two pyruvates, one and two. One and two, my right? two pyruvates right there, which is a three carbon molecule. And this is this the end of glycolysis. So before we go anywhere, I want you to I want to summarize what we just did here and what we got. Okay? So let's look let's count ATPs. How many ATPs did we gain out of this process of breaking glucose into two pyruvates? Here we produce two out of one, plus two is four, but we had to use two, so the net gain is two ATPs, and this is glycolysis. Two ATPs. What else did we gain here? We got one NADH out of this one, 
1 and ADH out of that one, picking up electrons. So we got two NADH molecules. And of course, we get two pyruvates. That because they have three carbons each, and they have a lot of hydrogens, is still a lot of energy to come. This is the summary of glycolysis. And the first step here is what we call the investment phase. We have to invest to, to destabilize the molecule of glucose and break it down. And the second part is the payoff, where all that rearranging of molecules results in electrons that can be picked up by NAD+, and also results in enough energy that allows to the transfer of a phosphate that is very energized directly from a substrate to a molecule of ADP. Okay? So this is substrate level phosphorylation, directly from a substrate to a molecule of ADP. All right? So this is the end of glycolysis and hello, hello, did we use any oxygen? Did we use any oxygen at all? I didn't mention the word oxygen and if you look at the play-by-play -play, uh, that you have in your textbook, you are not going to see any oxygen. There is absolutely no oxygen required. Glycolysis is an anaerobic process that yields two ATPs, two NADHs, and two pyruvates. That's it. No oxygen. So we have not seen the oxygen at all. All right? So now we are going to grab our pyruvates and the pyruvates, if there is oxygen around, remember oxygen is calling the electrons, come to me. If there is oxygen around, and we know the oxygen is diffusing from your red blood cells into the cell, all the oxygen really is diffusing into the inside of the mitochondria. All the oxygen you're gonna see is really diffusing to the inside of the mitochondria, to the matrix. So, if there is oxygen inside the mitochondria, what you are gonna see, the pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule, and I have the uh, formula right there written for you. Sometimes looking at the formula is much more useful. So you have the formula there. Check it out. Three carbons. Notice that we lost some hydrogens there. Aha! Those hydrogens, remember glucose has a hydrogen attached to every carbon. Those hydrogens were the ones that went to the NADH. And notice that the third carbon has a COO. COO. Hmm, interesting. So what's going to happen? These two pyruvate molecules, our two pyruvates, pyruvate number one and pyruvate number two, are going to go into the mitochondria through a transport protein. Now, as soon as they get into the mitochondria, boom, they get attacked by enzymes, three enzymes at the same time. This is brutal. What's going to happen to our pyruvate that had three carbons as soon as it gets to the mitochondria? So here comes my three carbon pyruvate. As soon as it gets here, it's going to lose one of the carbons. An enzyme breaks that bond and releases, breaks off one of those carbons. Mm-hmm. Then, since you snap a carbon, what's going to happen? Somebody has to pick up those electrons. So here comes NAD plus 
and it's gonna pick up those electrons and it's gonna become NADH. It's gonna be reduced to NADH. The second thing, the third thing that is gonna happen, there is a special molecule called coenzyme A and that coenzyme A is gonna be attached. It's like a chaperone. Don't panic too much about it. It's like a chaperone that is attached to it. Now, when you lose my three carbons there, when you lose a CO2, the electron from that bond that was broken gets picked up by NAD+, and you attach this coenzyme A molecule the new molecule, molecule that results is called acetyl-CoA. This is the CoA part. And your acetyl is only a two-carbon molecule, as is indicated here. Your acetyl is a two-carbon molecule. All right, and that's a very important process. So let me show it to you. So here comes my pyruvate into the mitochondria. So happy to be coming in. As soon as it comes in, an enzyme shook, snaps one of the carbons right there, CO2, and the electrons that were released get picked up by NADH, by NAD+. And then here comes this coenzyme A and attaches to it. Let me try to attach it. It's like a little chaperone molecule that is gonna attach and guide it along. So this new molecule is acetyl-CoA. My two carbons left and the acetyl over there. Now what's gonna happen to this acetyl-CoA enzyme molecule that I have here? Notice here, let me bring the focus much closer. Over here is, an enzyme, is a molecule with four carbons you don't need to know the name, but it's called oxaloacetate. It sounds so good, oxaloacetate. All right, that's a molecule with four carbons. And what's gonna happen, this coenzyme A that has two carbons is gonna attach to these four carbons. So I'm gonna have four carbons here and it's coming in the cycle and these two carbons are gonna attach to it and that is gonna form a six carbon molecule. That's gonna form a six carbon molecule. And the name of that six, six carbon molecule is called citrate or citric acid is the same. And the only reason I say that, you don't need to know this, is because the Krebs, Krebs cycle sometimes is also called the citric acid cycle because you make that molecule there. Okay? So that's what happens first. So our acetyl-CoA is going to join this four carbon molecule and it's gonna make a six carbon molecule. So my two, let me bring the image up. So I have my acetyl-CoA is gonna join this four carbon molecule and this new molecule that I have here is called citric acid. So what's gonna happen now? Ooh, now things get really interesting. All this is happening in the matrix, and no, they are not holding hands going in a circle. The molecules are moving and they just react as they find the correct enzyme. So what's going to happen now? Oh, the best part of all. First, one of these carbons, one of these carbons is going to be snapped off. So here we are going to lose a CO2. Just like before, what happens when you break the bond here? Every time you break the bond, electrons are gonna be released. 
And who's gonna pick up those electrons? NAD plus is gonna come in and it's gonna pick up the electron that was loose and now we have NADH. All right, so now the, since we lost one carbon, now we only have five carbons. Yeah? Guess what's gonna happen now? Da -da -da -da. Oh, and this carbon that was lost is CO2 and is going to, oh, let's do that, I love that. This CO2 is gonna diffuse from this area of high concentration, it's gonna diffuse until it goes to the blood and out through your lungs. Now we are going back inside. We have these five carbons here. Choom! Another one is gonna snap off with the help of another beautiful enzyme. Thankfully we don't need to remember the names or know them. So here comes our next carbon. Another CO2 is released out. And of course, when you break the bonds, you are gonna have NADH produced. So here comes my NAD plus. It's gonna pick up that electron and it's gonna leave us NADH. Good. So we went from six to five to four carbons. Now we are in four carbons here. So we have my four carbons, my four carbons with my acetyl-CoA attached. So here is where we are gonna have some, a lot of things happening and that I'm gonna summarize basically. In this step, the acetyl-CoA is gonna leave. Bye, it was nice to visit with you, goodbye. So the acetyl-CoA is gonna leave when the acetyl-CoA leaves, which color did I do it? Green. When my acetyl, my CoA enzyme, my coenzyme A, sorry, not acetyl-CoA, my coenzyme A leaves, notice that we just lost some bonds here, the molecules lost some bonds, so what's gonna happen here is gonna be a rearrangement of the atoms, all right? It's going to be a rearrangement of the atoms and the electrons are going to be moving around, rearranging and it's going to be very easy for one inorganic phosphorus to be energized enough with all these electrons going around that this molecule here, and just take it from me, is going to be able to pick up one phosphorus and attach it to ADP. The energy from this molecule, those electrons moving around after we release that uh, um, coenzyme, is gonna have enough energy that we can put this phosphate here in this ADP. So basically, we are making ATP. So here it comes an ADP and after the release of the coenzyme A, we are gonna have ATP, okay? Oof, we are almost there, be patient, hang in there. Now, this way of making ATP is just like before, is by substrate level phosphorylation because it was a simple molecule that had enough energy to transfer a phosphate into here. Same process as we saw in glycolysis. Now, we have four carbons. Now, if you look in your textbook again, uh, the diagrams that you have in your textbook in more detail about the Krebs cycle and you look at the molecules, yes, we have four carbons, but this has a lot more hydrogens than that one. This has a lot more hydrogens than that one. So over these next two steps, there's gonna be rearranging of the molecules again. 
moving around back and forth and what that is gonna cause is that you are gonna have hydro uh, electrons being released so here we are gonna have not NAD here we are gonna have our other carrier coming in and picking an electron I'll tell you later why this is a different carrier. So FAD is coming here and picking an electron. Then there is some more instability because an electron is missing and what's gonna happen here? Just take it from me. Here comes NAD plus and it's gonna pick another electron and it's gonna become reduced to NADH. That was a lot of work. That was a lot of work. And notice that the two carbons that we picked up here, we lost them here and we went back to four. And remember these two carbons came from pyruvate, which came from glucose. So by the end of this process, you end up breaking your whole molecule of glucose into individual CO2 molecules. Let's do some math. Let's do some math here. Please recall that we had two molecules of pyruvate coming in, right? Two molecules of pyruvate coming in. So if we have one molecule, that's what we just did here. We went through this cycle and we produce all this. Now, the second pyruvate comes. So when the second pyruvate comes, we repeat this. So in reality, all this, we need to double it because we want to do the math per one molecule of glucose. One glucose produces two pyruvates. This was for one pyruvate. Now we need to do it again for a second pyruvate. So let's add what we need to. So when you have two pyruvates, you have two CO2s here. You have two CO2s here. You have two CO2s here. You have two NADHs here. Making sure I'm there. You have two NADHs here. Two NADHs here. Two FADs and two. NADHs and of course the only one that we have left we have two ATPs so all these are twos coming in so we have to add the second coefficient to all of them because we have two pyruvates per each molecule of glucose. So let's do the math for this. Let's do the math. Let's remember that first we had done the math for just glycolysis right here and this is what we had. So now we are going to do the math for the rest of it. Okay? So let's do the math right here at the bottom. So what did we produce here? Let's see, what did we produce here? Let's summarize everything. We produce, let's start with CO2. We have two, let's see, where, there you go. We have two CO2s, plus two is four, plus two is six. Six CO2 molecules. 
basically every single carbon that was in glucose has been released one there, one there, one there times two is six let's count NADHs let's count NADHs we have two four six eight let's count ATP two and we have nothing else left because the carbons that we brought into the cycle this first carbon that was removed here and the, set, the two other carbons that joined all that we disassemble into molecules of CO2 and we capture their electrons so for this second part this is our total six CO2s eight electron car oh we are missing something did anybody notice what we are missing here? Oh, we almost forgot about this guy. Two fads. Two fads. So basically we have a total of eight electron carriers plus two electron carriers. Eight plus two equals ten electron carriers, right? Yes? How many electron carriers we got out of glycolysis? Two. 10 plus two equals 12. Those are the 12 electrons from the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Those are the 12 electrons from the carbon-hydrogen bonds. So please notice, out of the whole process here, two ATPs in glycolysis, two ATPs in Krebs. That's dismal. All this work for two and two ATPs, that's ridiculous. However, what did we get the most? We got a total of 12 electron carriers, and that is the important thing that we are going to carry on because... The one that has the electrons has the power, it has the energy. So please review this very well before proceeding. We are going to stop here. I hope this helps and thank you for listening. This is the end of part two.